In this second lecture, we're really going to focus on just that observations are always contain uncertainty. Then we'll talk a little bit about measurement systems as well as uh, get more in depth beyond just time response, but a number of other sensor characteristics. Well, there's nothing worse than an instructor who throws in references to movies that are now quite ancient, but if you've seen A Few Good Men, you know that the concept of truth plays a, a big deal in there, and Jack Nicholson has a quote, and hopefully in class you can all uh, uh, practice your Jack Nicholson interpretations. But we, what we really want to get across is this concept of a true value, and it's what we're trying to find, but we never can, or at least in most cases, uh, when we're dealing with environmental measurements, it's completely unknown. There are a few things that we know true values for. We do know the boiling and melting temperature of pure water, and, and we can do that for other substances as well, mercury, alcohol, so forth. I was able to find an uncertain Texas, but I have no idea if there really is an uncertainty a town or city somewhere in the United States. Brownie points if you can find it. But we're interested in measurement uncertainty. We know that a true value exists, but we don't know most of the time what it is. We do have measured values, and we want to get some sort of estimate that lets us know whether uh, truth lies somewhere within the range of our measured value. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, uncertainty is out there. We can't ever measure the environment with complete accuracy and precision, and we'll define here in a little bit what accuracy and precision is. And it's because the environment is chaotic. It's this maddening mix of randomness and order, which uh, you know just all environmental systems are. And our understanding of environmental systems is far from perfect as well. So you should always assume that observations have uncertainty. And it isn't that human observers are necessarily worse than automated observers, um, but there's a lot of subjectivity about human observations uh, relative to automated observations. But a human is much more able to discern characteristics of situations happening than an automated system is necessarily. But if it's, uh, whether it's an automated or a manual system, what time were the observations taken and what kind of equipment was used? And all that requires metadata, data describing the data. And how were the observations taken? That really helps to define some of the uncertainty. And sort of the classic statement, a man with a single watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. We run into this all the time. You put out two wind sensors, they're never going to necessarily read exactly the same. We'll talk about the climate reference network that has three temperature sensors out to try to re minimize uncertainty. All right, now let's shift gears a little bit and shift to measurement systems and different kinds of sensors and just start thinking about the different types of measurements, whether we're taking a direct measurement where we're actually getting in and we're at, you know, looking at some sort of object in terms of its length, time, and mass. And most of the time what we're dealing with in environmental sensors is indirect sensors where the impact of the variable of, of interest has on a sensor. It's not necessarily measuring the uh, uh, characteristic of the environment directly. And uh, this table just gives you, in a different field, kind of it gives you the relative sense of direct versus indirect types of measurements. Then we can talk about in situ versus remote. Uh, in situ means that the sensor is in direct contact with the, uh, the environment that you're trying to measure. And the sensor itself may influence the, the measurement then. Remote means there's no contact between the sensor and the measure, measured variable. Over here on the right are, uh, is an example of an in situ, this hockey puck looking thing on the top, which is uh, embedded into a road and can measure you know, road temperature, uh, what kind of chemicals are on the surface. They're, they're really valuable for measuring what the conditions are on a road surface. 
but the problem is every time they repave the road or do any kind of maintenance then uh, the puck is destroyed and those things uh, are quite expensive so there's a lot of shifting now to s these non-invasive road sensors so this is an infrared camera that's pointing down and it's measuring the uh, road temperature and in this way it can survive uh, just about anything that's happening to the road surface so we need to describe how we acquire data from an instrument so we need to kind of break the parts of an instrument down that we have some sort of input signal from the environment the sensor picks it up but the sensor is typically responding to such a small change in the environment that that signal has to be amplified and then we have to have a way to display it and that gives us an output signal so this chain from the input signal to the output signal goes through various parts of a sensor or instrument so if you go back and look at a, a mercury and glass thermometer or an alcohol thermometer which I think is uh, what's depicted here in this uh, little display uh, the input signal comes in that's the environment so you have some sort of change in the environment you hold the sensor which is the fluid reservoir down at the bottom and the the way the mercury and glass or alcohol and glass thermometer works is the amplifier is that the uh, fluid is pushed up through an extremely narrow little tube to be able to amplify this the change the the sensors uh, small temperature sensitivity and make it large enough that we're able to see it and then it requires our eyes in order and the scale here in order to be able to display it and give us an output signal that we can then write down your the text makes I think kind of the wrong distinction between passive and active sensors they talk about active is having its own power supply and a passive sensor is is uh, like one of these aneroid barometers where the what you see is actually a response to the change in pressure and then there's all the clock like mechanisms that are inside to be able to amplify that signal uh, my view is that a passive sensor sensors like a radiometer something where it's passively responding to the environment it just sees what the environment is is doing where an active one is where it requires an energy source to create the input that you're then going to measure so a radar a lidar uh, the kind of the sal old salometer here that you'll see examples of to the the second one on the the right here relative to the IR passive uh, radiometer that's here closer to the text now we're we're used to differences like with you know watches and clocks the difference between analog and digital but it's very important to understand the distinction for other instrumentation as well analog you saw in terms of the thermocouple is you get a continuous response to the change in the environment and it requires some way to change the you know this transfer transducer to convert the input to some sort of continuous output digital on the other hand is you get a discrete output as as the input signal comes in it's going to chop it into just sort of like a yes no uh, kind of, of signal so most of the mechanical type of analog sensors had a dial or a scale that's used as the transducer just like the little watch here or the aneroid barometer we talked a couple of slides ago uh, but there's all these electronic type analog sensors where the environmental change is is uh, uh, is recorded in terms of a voltage change and the analog part is the information is translated into pulses of varying amplitude and digital is you're transforming it into binary output zeros and ones where each bit is uh, reflecting two different amplitudes well keeping with the old 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 movie theme thinking back to fiddler on the roof and the mo and the song tradition one thing is to not think about standards as just being traditions because traditions can be uh, horribly out of date and I think of the uh, 
uh, meteorological code for observations that, uh, that we use as, as being a traditional standard which is horribly obsolete. So there's calibration standards, performance standards, exposure standards, procedural standards. Your, the appendix of the text has a lot of these. The BERT uh, book on uh, weather observations does a good job of going over these. And I have a couple of sort of the standards listed on, at the tail end of this presentation. So, it, but it is important to recognize that we do need to have calibration standards uh, for any type of measurement. Um, performance ones are the ones that are typically done in a laboratory uh, setting. Exposure standards are ones that the World Meteorological Organization does uh, for atmospheric type variables. And it's difficult to follow a lot of these exposure standards uh, you know, to, in all situations. There are a lot more pragmatic concerns that come in. Procedural standards really depend on the application. And people can get really hung up on uh, that, that some other entity is, has the wrong kind of standards. Uh, each one comes as a result of the needs of particular aspects of our environmental fields and uh, we just need to recognize that those exist. So calibration is important and uh, just to nail this concept down, it's a comparison between measurements. You have uh, a known magnitude made with one device, the standard, and another measurement made in a similar way as, as possible with a second device and uh, so we send sensors back to Campbell Scientific all the time to uh, get recalibrated uh, the temperature sensors uh, other manufacturers uh, many other uh, places will have their own calibration uh, techniques to follow and the goal of course is to reduce as much as possible any of the systematic bias type errors. It's not going to remove random errors because it's going to be through uh, uh, multiple measurements that you're going to be able to compare the standard uh, against the second device. All right, we talked about this in the first lecture, so I'm just going to uh, go quickly through this. Again, just a reminder of these different types of errors, static, dynamic, drift, exposure. These are all things that, that we have to deal with all the time and uh, be able to recognize how those are going to influence observations. Let's focus for a minute on the exposure errors, things like sighting errors. There can be, you know, just bad metadata where, or uh, unknown metadata where we really don't know how the observations are being taken. Uh, the instrument errors can be exposure, maintenance, and sampling. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of local sighting errors that you know, a lot of times people like to to uh, poke at as far as uh, you know that you sight a temperature sensor near a, a, a pipe that with heat coming out of a building having trees overhanging a precipitation sensor uh, observations around here of snowpack where that you're you're measuring conditions that are changing as a, as the snow accumulates so your elevation above the ground changes over time I like this example from Nevada where they put a wind sensor on a 20-foot tower here right next to a uh, uh, in a tunnel that with a big mountain just to the west of it this is near Carlin Nevada and there's a good pragmatic reason why they put it here and you just have to be able to recognize that you know there you know it makes a lot of sense they need to know in order to be able to treat the road uh, this really shady icy location in the winter time what the winds are like even though the wind can't ever hardly blow from the west because it's completely blocked so we have this concept of what's called a representativeness error. The observation here in this case that the wind, the wind observation is measuring what it's actually exposed to, but it's not necessarily representative of larger conditions. And uh, you know, it, it's representative of the fact that you got a big mountain just to your west. So I mentioned this uh, before in terms of the sensor performance characteristics. 
and uh, so I won't spend a whole lot of more time on it here but again most of the time they're they're defined statically in the laboratory and you have to recognize that um, they're going to change and be different depending on cost and characteristics of the instrumentation. So when an instrument manufacturer provides you with the performance characteristic information for a, for a sensor, in this case uh, Sensirian SHT uh, temperature and relative humidity sensors, they're going to give you a lot of numbers and they're going to tell you a variety of things and there's usually as in this example here there's a lot of footnotes uh, with the resolution, accuracy, response time, long-term drift and everything and you, you really need to pay attention to those. For example if you look at the accuracy of the uh, uh, slightly more expensive SHT75 plus or minus 1.8 uh, percent relative humidity at uh, 25 degrees Celsius and uh, plus or minus 3 degree, 0.3 degrees Celsius at, at uh, around 25 degrees Celsius and then they say well but that's the typical accuracy what's kind of the the worst accuracy you can expect and you can see that when you get uh, to really low relative humidities or very high relative humidities the accuracy becomes worse in the same way with temperature there's quite a uh, change in the accuracy when you get to really high or very cold temperatures. So let's now start explaining about some of these performance characteristics specifically accuracy and precision to begin with. So precision is just if we make a whole bunch of measurements how close they are with one another and uh, that you know that can be a very good trait that we get you know the same information given the same environmental conditions every time but a precise instrument can be woefully inaccurate and accuracy is how close a measurement or measurements are to the true value which again is unknown but we typically do that by trying to get a sense of how close the response is between our sensor and that of a standard when we vary the environmental conditions and uh, it's not the same as precision as described in the text if there's a systematic error and high accuracy can be really expensive and it just may not be worth it. All right, so we want to hit the bullseye. The bullseye is truth. It's the X in the center. And uh, the, the best situation is on the far left here. We have high accuracy, high precision, and very small uncertainty. You know, that the, if we were to average these three observations, they would, they would uh, give us the, you know, hit the bullseye. The second one from the left is a situation where we have high precision, we hit the same part of the bullseye, but it's not accurate. There's a systematic bias and there's quite a bit of uncertainty because the three observations do not enclose truth, they're far from truth. So the second one from the right is a situation where it's really quite accurate because if we were to average these three observations we would get close to truth but we don't have much in the way of precision there are you know the shots are all over the place so we have a lot of uncertainty and then the fourth situation here the far right is kind of the worst situation you can have every once in a while you get really close to truth but other times you're far from it so you have low accuracy low precision and a large amount of uncertainty the range is is an important characteristic of an instrument but honestly you you really only care about uh, the range of interest that you have for your particular environmental situation. Having an instrument that can go to extreme conditions on either ends uh, may be more costly and also the errors associated with it could be a lot a lot higher. Again going back to the to the Sensirian uh, example here in the two little figures at the bottom you know the the uh, even though the temperature sensor can go as low, you know, record from minus 40 to 100, the accuracy of those uh, diminish quite a bit as you get to the extreme ranges. So you might be better off getting another sensor if you're going to consistently measure uh, very high temperatures or very cold temperatures.
So the limitation is closely coupled with the range. It's the capability of a sensor to give accurate readings within the specified range. So even though, again, uh, in the case of the Campbell Scientific 215 temperature sensor, which uses that Sensirian SHT75, the measurement range is minus 40 to plus 70, but the accuracy is uh, considerably different depending upon uh, the highs and the lows. Resolution is another one of those important sensor characteristics. Uh, you know, you think about it in terms of a mercury and glass thermometer or something. You want to, to be able to resolve uh, relatively small changes in, in temperature, so you need to have a scale on the sensor to be able to detect to the level that you're interested in. So these two-dimensional plots uh, here show the differences, of course, between sort of a fine, high-resolution sensor in one respect and another which uh, has less resolution. So stability is just the reverse or inverse of drift, and it's the ability of an instrument to sustain its calibration. Here, in the case of a seismometer, shows how you can have a gravimetric meter here that you can have a pretty substantial drift over time. So they constantly have to uh, be recalibrating this against some known standard. So the threshold or the detection limit is the smallest uh, value that uh, for an input that you're going to see an output signal. And the prop anemometer is a good example of this. Uh, it takes a certain wind speed in order for it for the blades to start spinning. And so wind sensors often don't record really light winds. In the example here, the RM Young, a uh, really common sensor, it has a pretty large range. It can go up to very high values of wind speed. The accuracy is, is high, but the threshold for the propeller is a meter per second or you know, two and a half miles per hour. So you're not gonna measure really light winds with this kind of prop anemometer. All right, let's start to put some of these concepts together. Imagine you take one measurement and it's a value of two. And then you take a whole bunch of measurements and sometimes they're as low as minus five and sometimes they're as big as five. But when you average them all together, they come out to, to be zero. And it's most common that you get values that are right around zero. Unfortunately, truth in this case is minus two. So we have a systematic error we would see in terms of the bullseye that we're off kilter, you know, that the true value for the most part is lying outside of what we would be expecting from all of our average values. All right, so again, let's just try to summarize the systematic versus random errors. There, most manufacturers um, of instrumentation and most users tend to expect that errors are more random and tend to underestimate the systematic errors or biases that uh, that take place so you know random is you know we just have to accept it it's what's not predictable or determinable it can arise physically due to changes in the environment you know the environments are constantly changes and it can be just errors due to faulty equipment or observer being careless or whatever and you just assume that those things aren't necessarily going to happen in the same way every time but systematic errors are a, a, a bigger issue to deal with because you might be able to get very precise uh, data but it's you know it's it's wrong and you know it's a consistent response of a measuring device to environmental conditions or it could be faulty characteristics of the instrumentation. Now, in, you know, instrument manufacturers, when they go through the calibration, can correct for systematic errors and, and remove those. So if it's a systematic error in the instrumentation, that, that's not really a, a big problem as long as you know uh, how it responds relative to a calibration standard. But the, in the field, systematic errors can be quite different in one weather regime versus another. And uh, 
So for temperature sensors, whether they're aspirated, whether there's flow that's mechanically pushed by the sensor as opposed to depending on uh, having wind blow across it can make a big difference and we'll talk quite a bit about that with respect to temperature sensors. And uh, you can you know, have temperature sensors heat up by excessive reflection of solar radiation from a snow surface that uh, can, can either bounce and, and hit a part of the sensor that you would normally think wouldn't be exposed uh, to the elements. So again, just summarizing, looking at those bullseye plots in the upper right hand, high accuracy and low precision observation are an example of random errors uh, because you average all those observations, it comes out close to truth in the center. Uh, but the other case where the high precision observations are exhibiting a lot of systematic errors. And if you can, and if you can determine that, then the precise observations can be corrected and give you some really good information. So another important characteristic is sensitivity. And it's, we try to measure what the change in the system output is for a given change of the input signal. And so it's a measure of the accuracy of the output signal. All right, so let's look at a, an arbitrary here example where a transfer plot, which is the x-axis is showing the input signal and the y-axis is showing the output signal. And so what we're trying to get is a, is a sense of what we're going to be able to detect, what we're going to be able to see relative to what is actually uh, going on. So in this case, the, this sensor, what we're going to see is output is going to be harder to discriminate at low values of the input because the output is hardly changing at all while the input's changing a lot. Whereas when the input is really at higher values, the output is more sensitive uh, to those. And the nonlinear response is much more difficult to deal with than the linear case. It doesn't necessarily mean that the slope has to be the same for a linear, I mean, you know, that you can have different linear slopes uh, would give you different sensitivities as well. So the final uh, characteristic that we're going to describe is just the signal to noise ratio used a lot for acoustic, radar, LIDAR, all of those kind of things. And the signal to noise ratio compares the level of a desired signal to the level of the background noise. And typically, of course, we want to have this be as a large a value as possible. It's often in log or decibel kind of scales. So uh, uh, a ratio higher than one to one, which would mean that you have a lot more signal than noise is very uh, important. So let's take a look at a signal to noise plot from a SODAR, which is an acoustic sensor sending up a sound pulse and there's always background literally noise in this case, noise, acoustic noise. And it's scaled in this case such that 10, uh, the colors that are sort of in the greens and into the anything that are reds and dark reds, that's good. The ratios are 20 to 1. The pores are the blues where the signal in this case is 5 to 1. To wrap up, it's really important to recognize uh, the the almost infinite sources of uncertainty that, that can exist and that you're just going to have to deal with that. That these sensor characteristics are very critical for when you're purchasing and how you're going to use that information. And that uh, you know don't assume that errors are random. There are lots of systematic and biased data out there. It doesn't mean it, it isn't useful data, it's just you have to understand what those biases are. And of course, in environmental fields, we're blessed with uh, lots and lots of observations that uh, allow you to get a sense of the sensors in a variety of different uh, conditions. But that, of course, is also the curse because uh, you're, you're always having to deal with changes in environmental conditions uh, distinct from those that people would measure if they're just doing laboratory type exercises. And just as an appendix, if you're really, really interested, go look at the World Meteorological Organization guide or the National Weather Service guides that, that cover a lot of these subjects in more detail.